Healthcare is changing, and Dr. Nancy R.N. is here for you. The topics are many, but each program stands on its own with three key action points for you to learn. Your guide to a healthier you in a changing world. Dr. Nancy R.N. Welcome to Dr. Nancy R.N., Healthy World, Healthy Nation, Healthy You. I'm Nancy Valentine, PhD and registered nurse, and this show is dedicated to you, the healthcare consumer. And today our show is on patient advocacy. We have had some other shows on patient advocacy as well, but I think you're going to enjoy the angle that we're really exploring today because the title of our show is Getting Value in Patient Advocacy Services. How can you as a consumer be wise in finding the right healthcare advocate who will indeed advocate for your specific needs? Now you may be wondering, when do I need an advocate? Well, you may need an advocate when you're simply admitted to a hospital and you have a complex case and you want to be sure that the flow of all of your treatments and especially your care planning for your discharge is going smoothly. You may be an adult child caregiver of a parent or parents and you need some guidance on how to help your parents through this process. You may really find that an advocate could be a great resource for you. Or you may have gotten a very large medical bill and before you pay it, you want someone who is independent to go through that medical bill, explain it to you, and help advocate, advocate with you for the final payment of that bill. So our guest today is a super advocate, someone that has a great deal of skill in this area. And I'd like to introduce our guest today, Linda Ralinu. Linda has her own company um, and has been very successful in that area. So she will be talking with us today about her experience. She's been a nurse for 24 years. She has done a lot in this area and she is an extremely wise nurse. And through that wisdom, she's gonna help us guide us through the following key points. Our first point is that she wants to remind us that nurses are probably your best resource for uh, being an advocate because with Florence Nightingale, we all learned as nurses about advocacy as part of our training. This was very much embedded in all of our coursework. So we have high touch, we know about consultation, and we also know about self-help. Now, once you are in a situation, you want to know what you can expect from a patient advocate. And we are going to give you a lot of tips and guidance on that process so that you will know exactly what you are getting and that value proposition of if you're paying for this service in many cases, what you can expect to get. And then we're gonna ask you and give you the script on what exactly you should be asking your patient advocate to do for you. So with that as our introduction, I want to uh, invite Linda to be our guest today and to welcome you, Linda. Thanks so much for being with us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. That's, thank you. That's great. Well, tell us about how you got your business started and tell us a little bit about it. I, I'd like to know more about it myself. Okay. Well, Genuine Healthcare Resources was started in 2009. Uh, we're all registered nurses, high-functioning registered nurses with multiple background. And it came about because of seeing a lot of individuals falling through the black holes, having difficulty maneuvering through the healthcare system. And with my particular background of not only being a registered nurse, but also having my master's in healthcare policy and public administration, coming from many years of managed care in the health insurance industry, the pharma industry, home health. Uh, we just thought it made sense to pull together and develop a company or a firm that can use all of that skill and all of that knowledge to help people navigate through and maneuver through successfully and with less stress and with knowing that they've got someone behind them that they can call whenever they need. That's very yeah. good. Part of our show is to help you as the consumer navigate through the healthcare system. That doesn't mean that you always need a formal advocate. Navigation can be something that you can do on your own in certain cases. But today, what I think is important for you to, to uh, appreciate is when you could use an advocate because advocacy services are above and beyond what you are getting in your hospital stay, for instance. Let's use that as our first example. There are many patient uh, advocates, in the, in, as they think they are advocates, obviously, in the system. You have your physician team. You have um, discharge planners. You have case managers. So I think it would be very helpful, Linda, if you could help to differentiate, because the average person 
is not going to understand necessarily when and under what circumstances they should bring in this third party advocate. Can you tell us about that? Um, sure. Uh, one of the instances where we find where it's very helpful is you mentioned before the adult child. We have an adult child managing the care of mom and dad. Mom and dad is admitted or may have been readmitted again for maybe the second, third, or fourth time. That's usually when it's a good idea to bring in an advocate because it's becoming much more complex. You're trying to work, you may have your own children, you may have your own health care issues going on. And so it's nice to have someone who has that expertise behind you to give you some guidance. I guess is especially if mom and dad are being admitted multiple times and then you have multiple discharges, in and out of skilled nursing, in and out of rehab, it's usually a good idea to have someone with some expertise to help you work through that, have things go more efficiently. Um, and sometimes it even makes a difference which skilled nursing or rehab you go to. So a good nurse advocate is able to help you find what's going to work well for your mom and dad. So you're saying that in those cases, your services really help to knit all those pieces together. Exactly, exactly. Because even, I mean, even though case managers and social workers do a great job, we all know they have large case loads. And many times the adult child still has a lot of questions to ask. There's a lot of pieces of the puzzle that need to be put together. And we have found that they love the idea of being able to just pick up the phone, call, and the lead nurse that's working with them is able to walk through their issues, answer their questions, explain it to them when they're in their own home, and it's a little bit more calm, and they can really take the time to walk through the questions and answers. Mm -hmm. And they find that extremely helpful. And then, of course, we will go to the home if needed. We will go to the skilled nursing, the assisted living. We will go to the hospital, and we will talk to them. And we will talk to the teams, and they find that very helpful and very comforting. Right. So what we're, we're labeling as advocacy is really high touch coordination of care. And I'm wondering how hospital staff receive this because having worked in many hospitals, right, yes. I think that a lot of the staff feel that that's their job, that that's what they do. But obviously you have built a business on those gaps. Right. And that's so, what it so is. That, so tell us about what happens in real life because that's what I think our audience wants to hear because you may find yourself in this situation and people need to sort of differentiate when can they rely on hospital staff and that's enough and when do they really need to bring in an advocate. Right, right. And I will say that is true. Uh, we have found that when we were first going into the hospitals there was pushback, there was concern, they were wondering who we were, why we wanted to know what we wanted to know and uh, there is a little bit of that um, back and forth in the beginning. What we learned and what they've learned, which has worked out really nice, is that once our nurses were working with the social worker, the nurses on the floor, the case manager, they came to actually like the fact of having our nurse as a resource. Because since we are all nurses, that's another set of hands. That's another nurse. Right. So it'd be amazing how many times the case manager, the social worker, would then be calling our nurse to say, listen, this is where we are, this is where we're going, this is what I talked about with the family. Do you think it might be helpful if you can talk and explain this to them while I'm over here doing this? Already learning to start to share and work together. We've had a couple uh, case managers at Penn actually say to us, working with you has been phenomenal. This has been the best thing. I had an ER physician from HUP call at 10 o'clock at night because it was a client that showed up at the ER on a Friday night at Penn Center City. We all know what that ER must have been like. He called at 10 o'clock at night to actually thank us because our help was so phenomenal in that craziness of just helping this one patient through. I thought that was phenomenal. So once they actually get to work with us, they like us. But I think in the beginning, because of the newness, they're not sure what to expect. Right. They, they don't realize that we're actually there to help and to augment and to bridge all those gaps that they can't necessarily fill because they are so busy. They do have such large caseloads. They are all over the place and yet we can focus on you as our client, as our patient, and help walk through all that. So by the end, they've all been actually very grateful. Well, that's good to hear because it's not really duplication of services. I think that Linda's point is really important and it's valid. Inside of any institution, the case managers, many of whom are also nurses, uh, or discharge planners, they could be nurses, social workers, people with clinical backgrounds. They do have large caseloads, so it's, it's fine for the average person that's just sort of moving through the system. There are no real glitches, but if you have a complex case or if you're finding that 
your next step in the process isn't working, it's good to know that you would have this advocate to call upon, that this service would really be able to sort of work through all of that complexity. Um, and often you can't really see it until it's, you're right in the middle of it. It's hard to see it coming sometimes in certain cases. But what I'm thinking about, Linda, is the analogy that I'm thinking about is that in the old days, there used to be private duty nurses. And private duty nurses were brought in if you were very sick, particularly post-op. And this still happens today, but much less so. Uh, if you were in the hospital, you had surgery, for instance, you would uh, engage a private duty nurse for maybe several days. And that person would be your one-on-one -on -one nurse. That way, with all the other nurses and other staff, you knew that you were going to get this one-on-one -on -one attention. You weren't going to be in the middle of a very busy floor with people having to be stretched over, over many uh, patients. This is the new version of the private duty nurse. Almost, you're right. Almost. Because the new version of the private duty nurse is to nurse all the pieces of the system that are so complicated in some cases that that becomes an issue in not getting the right care at the right time or not being sent to the right next place um, if you need a rehab um, course or you need to go to a nursing home or you're going to a hospice center. What I hear Linda saying is that with their vast experience, they are able to guide you. They know the best places. They know the staff there. They, they are able to sort of give you that bridge that you may not have otherwise. So I think that's, that sounds mm -hmm. very reasonable. Exactly. Yep. So mm -hmm. tell us why you are so high on nurses being advocates, because there are other organizations that do not employ nurses. Tell us about those, but tell us then why you feel nurses are really the key. I feel nurses are the key, number one, because patient advocacy is actually a core competency of nursing. That's what nurses are, that's what nurses do. And we actually approached the accrediting body for the ANA about a certification for a formal certification like you could have for cardiology or renal for nurses for patient advocacy they said that they weren't even thinking about that because every nurse in and of themselves as being a board certified nurse is a patient advocate so, so it doesn't warrant a separate certification that's interesting i think we have to step back and translate yeah. some of that for, for you ANA is the American Nurses Association. It's very much like the American Medical Association. It is a trade association for nurses. And inside of the trade association of the American Nurses Association is a whole other arm called the Credentialing Center. So the Credentialing Center gets involved in uh, having tests and, and certification for nurses that are in various specialties. So if you're a cardiac nurse or a nurse practitioner or a psychiatric nurse, you can get specialized credentialing for that, that specifies that you have risen to a certain level of knowledge, education, et cetera. So when you were saying, let's have a, a certain certification for advocacy, their response was, we don't think that's appropriate because we expect every nurse to have that core competency. So I think that's exactly. really, again, uh, emphasizing the, that part of what nursing practice is all about is being a patient advocate, no matter where they are. They don't have to necessarily be in a role where it is titled nurse advocate. Right, exactly. So basically, patient advocacy is nursing practice. So that's one of the reasons why we think they should be nurses, because that is nursing practice. The other reason is because a patient advocate needs to be extremely highly skilled, because when you are advising and guiding family members or patients, and notice you're giving advice, you're giving guidance, you're assessing a situation, and you're giving answers, that's nursing practice. You're looking at the clinical situation, and then you're helping the patient and the family move through that correctly, maybe having conversations with physicians and nurses. That is, a, that is a medical nursing role to be able to do that. You want someone who's talking with the physician or the nurse or the team to have at least somewhat of an equal footing when you're having that conversation. At the same time, the advocate needs to be extremely savvy in healthcare policy and in insurance and appeals and what's approved and what's denied and pre-certification because it's great to have agreement that we're gonna have a certain service or a medical plan done it's another thing then to make sure that it's gonna be paid for. So the advocate not only holds the, the clinical side of the mm -hmm. patient in their hand, they are walking in tandem in parallel holding the financial side. 
So the advocate must be able to walk in tandem both clinically and administratively down the healthcare industry. A good advocate is good in both because you can't do one without the other mm -hmm. because the person also has to be either be able to pay for it or know who's going to pay for it. And as we all know, some bills, we've had patients whose bills were over quite a few hundred thousands of dollars. When you're giving guidance and you're walking someone through that, that's a lot of money to take responsibility for. So you really shouldn't just be anybody because if that person runs into hard times and they have to claim bankruptcy or lose their house, you're the one that gave them some of the guidance. Even though in the end they make the decision, you're the one that's still setting up the pros and cons and the options. Right. So you need to be really clear when you're handling people's money and you're handling people's health. Right. Which is why I say they need to be high functioning nurses who are able to balance both. Right. Well, I think um, Linda's uh, term of high functioning nurses is real, are really around nurses who have a lot of experience and very broad experience. So they mm -hmm. have a lot of clinical experience. They understand how the system works, what patients need. They understand care planning. They can speak very eloquently with a physician, a specialist. They know what, the, what they're talking about. They have that language skill but they also have the insurance and the finance skill. And a lot of nurses are really combining that, that skill set now so that they really can have these kind exactly. of conversations. Exactly. But tell us about your experience with non-nurse advocacy services because without damaging what they're doing, I mean, right. after all, they feel that they've got a, a role. Right. Again, for our consumers, helping people navigate, when would they find themselves maybe talking to a non-nurse advocate? When you're ta usually when you're talking to a non-nurse advocate, many times it's when you're talking to an advocate that is being paid for by your insurance company or someone else is paying for those services. Because then think about, by paying for those services, number one, it's a lot more cost effective to pay for a lay person that maybe went through a three or four week you know, orientation training and then put on a phone queue that's a lot more cost effective than having to pay for, for registered nurses or case managers or even social workers to, to man. So many times it's when you're finding someone else paying for it, especially your health insurer. The, the complexity there, which we tell everyone that they need to understand is that when, and having come from, I worked in the health insurance industry for eight, eight and a half years, so I know where they're coming from. When you're dealing with working with someone that's been paid for by your health insurer, you need to understand the fact that there is now someone else in the mix. 100% of the loyalty is not to the patient because now there's another contract in play. There's a larger contract in play mm -hmm. now. So they're trying to balance between being able to help you while at the same time not upsetting the other person. Um, so you need to be careful about conflict of interest. So for instance, if Blue Cross or Aetna United Healthcare pays for the advocate for you and then you need to fight Blue Cross or Aetna or United Healthcare for an appeal or a denial to get a claim paid. Now that advocate who's being paid by Aetna or United Healthcare Blue Cross now has to go back and fight them so that you get what you want. That's a that creates a conflict of interest. So are they going to go to the CEO of Aetna as we would if it takes it to that point and go to executive inquiry? Are they going to go as high as the insurance Pennsylvania Insurance Commission. I mean, you're you're a phone queue person. That's and you have your scope of practice as a lay phone queue person. How far are you going to push, knowing that there's this huge contract out there? How much leeway do you really have? We found that th sometimes mm -hmm. that the conflict of interest has not done the best, and so we've had people from those other companies call us to ask us because they didn't get to where they needed to be. Sometimes, unfortunately, we couldn't help them because they either already, you know, they already used up their appeals, and most people don't know. You can only go through the appeal once. That's extremely important to understand. You can't go through the appeal and say, you know, we tried it on our own, now it didn't work, now I want to hire someone. You can only go through the appeal process one time. So if you use an advocate that really doesn't understand and it's still denied and you blew that process, you can't now go through it again. Okay, but this is, this is yeah. an access question because right. we were talking earlier about how people access your services. They right. really come from more of a clinical base from at least the examples that we used earlier. How would these uh, consumers be even channeled to an advocacy service I around bill paying, which is your example that you just gave? Is that how they, they get into these other advocacy discussions? You mean working with other agencies? Right, I mean, your, your example was, um, 
about bill paying? Who even right. who even channels them to the way the way that works is that that sort of many times that's working through the employer. So the employer, your employer, works with an agency that sold them the health insurance. So as an example, let's just say only because they're the biggest in the area, that ABC you know electrician went to a a broker and bought Blue Cross. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now they bought Blue Cross, and Blue Cross now says we will pay for you to have an advocate. So Blue Cross is paying the advocate to fight themselves. So Blue Cross pays X advocate simply because your employer went through the broker and through those stakeholders, they then give you access to the other person. I see. And is that around ma mainly uh, medical uh, insurance issues or can it be around any issue? Um, usually, well, that's the other thing too that gets a little complicated is Sometimes some of the advocacy groups will say, or the other advocacy organizations will say, we'll help you make doctor's appointments. Um, you know, they'll sort of help you through, uh, find a doctor. There's sort of like a, uh, between a scheduler and a dispatcher. You know, they'll, they'll guide you through how to do an appeal. Um, the services kind of differ because they're not, they're not a, a private professional advocate in the sense that we are, and some of the others. There's a, there's a few others out there that are like us as well, that are truly nurse advocates that get into the nitty gritty and really help out. Whereas the, the bigger phone queue ones tend not to get in as, as deep um, and as one-on-one -on -one and as personalized as we do. So sure, you can call them about a billing question, you can call them and say, I want to do an appeal. You can call them about the other things and they'll kind of guide you through it. But because it is so complex, you need to know what you're doing and you really need to take the time to do all of that work. And that's, that's usually a little bit more than what they're, they're their setup is able to do right. because they're a large phone queue, right? They can't right. necessarily get into that detail. And so then the individuals will call us and say, I went to my employer. My employer said that through our insurance, we have XYZ. I tried them. It didn't work. I need your help. Then we look through the case. Sometimes we can help. Sometimes we can't because the answer they got from the phone queue person wasn't correct. But now what people don't understand, sometimes uh, health care can be just as legal you already went through your legal process, so now you've only got so many options left. Okay, so I think that the translation I take away from this, mm -hmm. and I want you to, to um, edit my comments as, as ne needed, if you are looking for something with sort of light touch, you want to find out about different uh, physician services in the area, or if you need something scheduled, or something that, that is not a complicated situation, using these services that your employer has paid for, which you then can access for free, might be a reasonable thing to do as a first step. Mm -hmm. But then if things become complicated, because they do not have a clinical background, and that may not even be part of the scope of their services right. anyway, they would move to this second step, which is really your kind of services, where it is a nurse advocacy service. Is that, is that a reasonable way right. for people to sort of understand how am I going to start with this if I need it at all? Right, exactly. I mean, we do both because we have multiple different, different um, programs, so we could do all of those if someone had wanted. Um, but you're correct. If they wanted to start with one that the employer has already paid for, that mm -hmm. the insurer's already paid for, what we would recommend is the moment that the insurer's advocate pushes back and tries to drive you down a path that you're not comfortable with, drive you in an area that that's not what you expected or drive you in a certain way, the conflict of interest might be kicking in and that's where it might be a good idea to call someone like us or some of the others who are a little bit more involved to make sure that you're not being driven down a path that really isn't necessarily in your best interest. If all is going well, you're getting good answers, you feel comfortable with it, I think that's fine. But the moment you feel uncomfortable or they're pushing and you have to have a back and forth, that's probably when now it's time to step back from them because they have their marching orders. Can you give and us one, one example of that, what a pushback might feel like or sound like? Um, you might want to use a particular facility or provider and they might want to try to guide you through a different facility or provider just because they know that they have a cheaper contract. Mm -hmm. So they want to pay cheaper, so they're going to guide you to someone else versus who you might want to use. Um, you might be having issues with medications where sometimes you're flipped from the brand name drug to the generic 
And some people do absolutely fine with generics. A lot of people do fine with generics. However, there are some that don't. So then they need to flip back to the brand name. So what they might do is try and hold you to the generic or actually start to have you use different generics of different drugs that aren't even the same kind of drug you started with. Um, you'll, you'll start to feel that, that push that pushback. Uh, we've actually had people call and say they wanted to do an appeal and they push back pretty hard about, well, it's probably going to be a waste of time because it is what it is and you're going to go through all this work for nothing. Uh, that's a pushback you might hear because they don't want you to do the appeal. Another one that we had called said, well, they had actually told me that it wouldn't be worth hiring an advocate because you can't do any more for me than what I could do. And they really want to hear from me, the patient. They really don't want to hear from you because my experience is what's going to make the difference. Now, what makes the difference is you as the patient are probably going to say something you shouldn't and you're going to nix your own denial because an appeal is like a law case. It becomes a legal part of your record and what you say is extremely important. So they're looking for those catches to catch you to go, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to hold that denial. You bring someone like else or any one of our other counterparts who are equally as good as we are on board, they know then that there's no game playing anymore. And they know they're not going to trip us up to say something that's going to kill the denial because we already know what wording to use, what wording not to use. So the moment they tell you, you should do the appeal, don't bring in a professional. That's like someone telling you to go to court without a lawyer and, uh, and represent yourself. That's just not right. smart. Well, yeah. I can tell that Linda is very experienced in this, and uh, that's why I love these shows, because I learn so much myself from my colleagues like Linda. And I think that what I've heard her say is that there are services out there that are very good services that are paid for by the, by the insurance company. Employers feel that they are doing the best thing for their employees by engaging these advocacy services. And they may, for things that are pretty routine, very good for you. And, and you don't necessarily have to go to a private pay kind of arrangement, which is what Linda's service and many other nurse advocacy services are doing. But it's always good to have plan B. So plan B, as you heard her just explain, is that when things get complicated or you just want another opinion, this is a very good, solid value for something that you need really some very clear answers on, or you want to find out what another course uh, could be for your determination, whatever that may be. It sounds like this is the kind of professional advocacy services that may be the best value for you. Now, Linda has many good people on her team. And she really looks for the right people that have that right credentialing background where they've, they've been very skilled. They need to have had that broad background. So because she employs these kinds of people and other services, as she mentioned, do the same um, that are nurse advocacy organizations, you have every right to ask about their background, whether they have really developed their team to this level. So you are the consumer you can ask that and we are going to have on the website a checklist so that you can go through that checklist if you are thinking about an advocacy service and it will list the things that you can ask so that you will be forewarned and forearmed so that when you are engaging a nurse advocate you are going to get the best value. Mm -hmm. Is there okay. anything in closing, any advice you want to give our listeners, Linda? The main thing I always say is ask questions. Never be afraid to ask questions. That's the most important thing. The more information you have, the better you can make a decision that's going to work for you. So never be afraid to ask, whether it's doctors, nurses, lawyers, the advocacy group that your employer hires. Never be afraid to ask questions. That's very good advice. And we have heard that advice on a number of our shows because that's what this is all about. It's really empowering you so that you understand that you are not just sort of swept into the system, that you can also take responsibility and by asking questions, get the answers that you need, want, and desire so that you can be the captain of your own ship. So thank you so much for joining us. I wanna thank Linda for being our guest today. It's just a pleasure to spend time with such a knowledgeable and experienced colleague. So thank you very much and have a wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today and that the information will help you in meeting your health goals. Catch this program and other conversations on the website, drnancyrn.com. Or you can write to me as well. I welcome your comments and feedback. Thank you for listening and join us again. And remember, 
With health, all things are possible.